Hello, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the Future Report 2022. We have an exciting program planned for you today. As many of you know by now, this report is an annual outlook on trends that Shipstead has produced for uh, eight years now. It's available online for everyone, and it covers themes within technology, people, and business that we in Shipstead think are interesting. And of course, a few of our own stories. And before we start some of the presentations from the report, I want to give a very warm welcome to Shipstead's own CEO, Kristin Skogenlö. Hi, Hi Mari. Hi, and hello, How everybody. Are you today? I'm doing well. Christmas is approaching. I'm getting uh, getting there. <laughs> a lot to do before Christmas, but uh, I, I now sort of see that we're getting through, so it's good. Great. So before we start the show here today, what does the F Shipstead Future Report mean for us as a company and uh, for you? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm very proud of the Shipstead Report. I think, first of all, because it has great uh, content. Uh, you know, it is, it is a, an opportunity to peek into the future and what's awaiting us. And I believe it's so important that we step back once in a while and actually have a thought to that and make sure that what we do today is what's going to be relevant tomorrow. So that's, I guess, the, the biggest, uh, you know, or most important thing with it. But then, of course, I'm really proud that, you know, we can showcase our own employees. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, written by our own people and it tells some of us, uh, some of our story. And it's, it's a very good read. <laughs> Kristin, today the overall theme is uh, investments and startups. And uh, this is a quote from you. We will make sure that what we do matters, both economically and for society. How do you make sure that that works? Who? Yeah, well, that is, first of all, we have a good methodology and we screen our investments. And what we screen them for is to see if they have the potential of really being uh, aligned with our values and create this positive circle where you end up serving all your stakeholders. Because of course we, you know, we first, I, I think foremost, we need to uh, cater to our users and readers and, and customers, but we also want to do good for the, for the society and the planet. We want to make sure we have happy and motivated employees. And we also want to have uh, happy shareholders. But this is a positive circle. If you make uh, products that are good in the first place, users will like them. When they adopt them and use them more, that will have a positive effect then on society. And that again will motivate our employees to work with it. And all of this will create business value, which will be good for our shareholders. So I think the clue is not to make these different interests be opposites, but make sure you, you find the concepts where this will work in unison in this positive circle. So that's what we're always aiming at. Thank you so much, Kristin. Um, see you later. <laughs> so our first future report speaker today is joining us live from Stockholm. Dan Okterloni is part of Shipstead, uh, Shipstead's management team and heads up our financial services and ventures division. 2021 has been a time for, uh, of change for entrepreneurs raising venture capital. And for founders, it has never been a better moment to start a company and seek funding. Dan will present his main thoughts from his article from the Future Report on how protocols, tigers, and unicorn hunters affect investment businesses and entrepreneurs, and what that means for a player like Shipstead. Hello guys. Thank you, Mari. Uh, you're right. There's never been a better time to be a founder with a few uh, software subscriptions and a couple of bank ID signatures. You can set up a fully, fully working company. You host your servers in the cloud with a few clicks and then you distribute globally through a couple of app stores. And with remote, you can recruit your team uh, on a global scale, not just people in your town. 
And today's main topic, there's never been more money around willing to take risk on your behalf to build your vision. In Europe this year, 125 billion of venture capital will be deployed in tech companies, according to Atomico's latest report. That's 125 billion that's going to be injected into high risk projects. It's more than two times uh, last year's number. Is this the peak? Are we going crazy? People are asking. It might be the peak. I don't know. But looking at the numbers, it could be even more if all of Europe came to the same level as Sweden, for example, per capita, it would be not 125, but 700, uh, 700 billion. So there's a, there's a long way to go still to reach California numbers. Uh, but if you think about another fact, EU only has about 7% of the global market cap of listed companies. Um, so, so, so there's still some potential to grow, I think. It might be the peak, but it might not. I'm, I'm optimist uh, by nature. So why so much capital and why now? Uh, first, governments want us to invest, right? They set interest rates to zero and, and stocks are sort of pretty high, which means capital starts seeking venture risk, high risk. And this is good. This is what uh, governments want, right? Taking risk on startup, creating jobs. Also, there's been great returns in venture capital, which means that capital is sort of seeking out and trying to get into those kind of returns. Uh, that means that uh, you know, there are more players coming in. And finally, the barriers that we were used to seeing in venture capital are coming down. So there's a lot of newcomers. Uh, it used to be sort of a mystery business, but now it's more, more of an open industry, to be honest. I'm going to give you a quick uh, walkthrough of, of uh, what, what I'm seeing and, and what the trends are. Uh, first, the unicorn hunter. Uh, maybe you were following VC like me a bit too closely. You could see it coming a few years back, the aggressiveness of, of the players and the capital cannon. Uh, it's a quote regarding SoftBank. Uh, they came into the scene in 2017, but you could sort of feel that they were more aggressive than all the rest by quite quite a long shot. Uh, they didn't come from the same circles as the Silicon Valley VCs that I guess we were all used to and trying to uh, mirror. And they broke a lot of unwritten rules. They threatened to invest in competitors and pushed up the round sizes more. You know, you need 50 million here, so take 500 million, that kind of aggressiveness. And they took a very public stance, used a different style of communication. They didn't quite succeed, maybe, uh, we'll see. Fund two is only a third of the size of fund one, not a good sign, I'm sure. They had some home runs, but also quite spectacular failures. Uh, but they did start the latest wave of change in the industry, at least in my opinion. Now there's a set of new kids on the block, and we used to call them tourists, a bit condescendingly. Um, Non-VC investors investing in venture capital, hedge funds, private equity companies. Uh, the tourists are now, you know, in our words, at least called tigers with quite a bit of respect uh, because the most famous of the tourists is actually named Tiger. Tiger is the name of the firm. Uh, and these tigers are now taking more and more of, of venture capital, almost up to 40% of the current volume of money is being deployed by these, these new uh, kind of venture investors. Uh, they've been around for, for a long time. They used to invest in tech stocks. Uh, they saw and loved tech and started doing venture capital in a totally new way. The standard approach used to be to network with founders for a long time, drink together, decide slowly over several months if you're going to invest or not, while talking to other friends, asking about the company, sharing deals then you do diligence, then you get on the board and try to help out. But Tiger does it the other way around. No relationships, no long processes, no board seats, just fast cash, if you quote a couple of, of uh, players in the industry and, and entrepreneurs. And this aggressiveness is blowing quite a few people away. Literally, you're getting out-competed from good deals. Uh, and one about the most talk things is that Tiger have different people, not West Coast US, but you know, ex-entrepreneurs and so forth. They have East Coast people from the New York bankers and consultants who you know, cut their teeth on Wall Street, long hours and massive slide decks. They're just different in, 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 in a quite big sense. And then there's uh, the new, new kids on the block, if you will. Um, it used to take you know, 10, 15 years to get into venture capital, long apprenticeships and so on, closed networks uh, and, and sort of a bit of an elite, right? But today, new firms pop, pop up all over the place. Entrepreneurs who made an exit, going to venture, 
and the new people in, in the industry sort of band together online. They use platforms like AngelList or Twitter and just raise funds, work together, share deals. Uh, you used to have to sort of be in that network, but now it's going public, which means you can mentor each other, you can write small checks, there's maybe you know, the, the, the blog, uh, that sort of upgrade into investing quite, a, you know, quite a common path. And maybe someone starts a podcast, uh, and upgrades that into investing. And there's networks like generation Z VC, and that's used for investing. And then there's the one K check, which is a sort of trend lately. It's a small check, a thousand dollars, but you know, if you get a hundred of those one K checks source that on Twitter, you know, with the, with the new US investment rules, you can have a bit more relaxed approach to that. And that's still $100,000 with a bunch of 100 uh, supportive early stage investors, a bit like uh, a public kind of Kickstarter. Then there's the entirely new thing, which is not even a kid on the block, but more, uh, let's say, uh, a protocol. And that's what I call it in, in my article in the future report. It's the latest craze, Web3, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, temporary uh, teams banding together in software uh, on blockchain. They form not a legal entity, but sort of a blockchain entity. This is pretty crazy stuff, right? But they can be used to invest in everything from startups and all the way to digital flash mobs that want to buy the US constitution or some kind of digital art. Maybe you heard of it, maybe you haven't. Check it out. It's pretty spectacular. Uh, one of those teams tried to buy a copy of the US Constitution. Uh, it's pretty, pretty good project, but it failed spectacularly because a hedge fund billionaire paid the, end up paying more. Uh, quite a story. Uh, and and you know, there, there's a few of these that sort of have had success. Uh, they don't have weekly partner meetings. They discuss some forums or a Discord, and they vote according to a governance protocol, not according to who has you know, the most clout of the partners in the firm. This is this is actually the, the sort of frontier at the moment in the visa business. So if you think about, you know, what's happening uh, and, and everything, it's never been better, uh, never been better. Uh, if you have a super risky project, today is a great time. Uh, you should go out and, and raise capital. That's uh, essentially it, right? It's improving for, for everyone, but there's still quite a few gaps as well. And that's something I think many people in the industry are quite worried about. Women investors and women founders get too little. Underrepresented founders often feel discriminated against, which is not good at all. It's improving, but it's improving too slowly. Uh, so there's not only uh, good stuff, but I think overall it's improving in the right direction at least. I'd like it to go faster and I think many would agree with me. So venture capitalists are attacked from all sides. What are people doing? Uh, there's the niche investors trying to attack you. There's the tigers. There's people banding together online. There's small checks. You know, people take different approaches. One approach is to try to copy or emulate the tigers, do what they do, but faster. For example, there are a few funds quite active in the Nordic regions. Uh, and you know, the other one is to to just do what the old VC did best: build local networks, get to know people early, add a lot of value, offer cash plus benefits. And Dreesen Horowitz is perhaps the most well-known VC using this approach. For a while, it used to be a joke that in the business, they hired so fast that everyone got a job there uh, and that they did as many hires as Tiger did deals in a year, give or take. Shibstead's approach is a, is a version of this strategy. Uh, we're investing in early stage Nordic founders and apply the strength of Shibstead, the corporation, in addition to the cash that we invest. We partner up with entrepreneurs on a mission to, to help uh, help their mission, which is also our mission. And uh, we try to do that because we think it's really good way to increase our impact in society. If you uh, want to build a big brand, we could be a great partner. My colleagues, Andrew Christian and Hannah will deep dive into this in a couple of minutes. So stay tuned. Guys, that's it. Go out, start a company, raise money, read the future report. Uh, back to you, uh, Mari. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. That was uh, really interesting to listen to you today. Um, so we're not a tiger at Shipstead, but if you were to give Shipstead an animal, what would you say Shipstead is? 
we're definitely bare. Uh, we're quite uh, cozy and fussy at most times, but we could also be quite fierce at some times when we're protecting our children or getting, you know, engaged in something. Eating blueberries for breakfast, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, that's very healthy. So um, all these uh, trends that you describe in your article and uh, in your presentation, how mm -hmm. will all this affect Shipstead as an investor? Will we have to change our investment strategy? Well, uh, competition is increasing, so we need to become better as well. You can never stand still, right? We, we need to run as fast as the entrepreneurs we invest in. So we will double down on what we already do, boost the companies we invest in and, and partner with. So that's capital plus bringing the full strength of ships that to bear. Um, branding, marketing, expert networks, that's our, our plan for next year. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Dan, for joining us from Stockholm this morning. Uh, we're excited to see what the next year brings when it comes to new ventures. Thank you. Bye-bye. Also uh, with me here today, I have uh, Andrew Kvalset, uh, Shipstead's new Chief Investment Officer, and uh, Christian Hornhansen, Lead Investment Manager at Shipstead Ventures. Hi, Mari. Hi, Christian. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Mari. Happy to be here. Hi, Christian and Andrew. Welcome uh, this morning. I hope you have a good morning. <laughs> Thanks, Mari. Thank Great morning. <laughs> Glad to be here. Good. So, uh, to start, what are some of your key focus areas right now? And what will be important for you guys when it comes to investment moving forward? Uh, Andrew, if I start with you. Sure. Thanks, Mari. Yeah, I think building on the things Don said, you know, the the landscape is constantly evolving. So we're working a lot now on the investment strategy with Don, Christian and others. And, you know, we know Shipstead will continue to have a very broad focus in terms of investing in early stages, later stages. But across that, you know, we'll remain highly focused on building companies and being a good partner. And I think Don touched on a lot of the things that Shipstead brings. And we're continually looking at how we can add value to companies as an owner. And in terms of the companies, we're really looking at the ones that support our vision, mission, and values on top of having great, great potential. So overall, we're, we want to work on how we can keep building on the success that we've seen so far. Hmm. And uh, how about you, Christian? What uh, do you focus on in your role? So my, I, I think that, I mean, we, above all, we're <clears throat> on a constant look at, look out for ambitious entrepreneurs. I mean, with the ability to build great teams, that's our job, uh, everyday job, uh, out there in the, in the field to say, but, uh, we're also looking for uh, digital startups addressing, you know, clear business opportunities, uh, with the ability to, to both shape and, and challenge, uh, existing business models out there. So, and for us at Chips, that is also important to find the models that scales with marketing and, and has an international potential, right? Um, that to say, we're, we're quite sector agnostic. Uh, we invest in areas such as, you know, fintech, energy, but also ed tech and, and health. Um, and currently, we're, we're also trying to deep dive into new areas. I mean, what's the implications of decentralized finance? Uh, and, and trying to also to understand the green shift, sustainable business model that, that, that I will touch on, upon a bit later as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think most importantly, we, we invest into startups where we see a strategic fit with Chipstead and, and that align with our values uh, and, and where we see that, uh, that Chipstead can be instrumental in building value over time. So, Andrew, uh, uh, how are we in Shipstead different from these uh, tigers that uh, Dan described in this description? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good question. And I think despite this, you know, amazing poster in the virtual studio, we are quite different from tigers. And we're not, you know, we're not purely focused on financial returns. That is a big focus. But we're really focused on helping entrepreneurs and having a positive impact 
on society, you know, and making sure that everything we do in our investments is, is, uh, is doing that and staying true to our values. And then also once we're owning companies, how can we be a positive owner that helps have that kind of impact? Mm. And what does it really mean that we only invest aligned with our values? Yeah, I think that the way we look at it, you know, it's not mutually exclusive um, going after good financial returns and investing aligned with our values and having a positive impact on society. And we, we both think the companies that are, are doing good, it helps perform well as well because customers and others obviously appreciate that. But we also use it to, in a way, spec the universe of investments that we look at. So we only want to be considering companies that we see align with that. And then within that universe, we want to really be finding the best ones and, and help accelerate them. Hmm. Christian, in, in your future report article, you talk about how we need to look at new sustainable solutions uh, when it comes to marketplaces or e-commerce. How do you think these trends will shape Shipstead's investment going forward? Uh, is being sustainable enough? So, yeah, um, I, I, I wrote an article about this in the future report, uh, and I, I truly believe that Uh, new innovative business models will be a driving force for uh, sustainability. Uh, our experience, though, is that sustainability in its own is often not the key driver in, in, uh, when it comes to choosing uh, a new product, service. Uh, I mean, customers today still want the competitive price. They still want the superior product and, and swift delivery, as well as it being sustainable. So that's basically what the new models need to deliver on. Uh, And I write about the textile industry, for instance, uh, in my article. I mean, textile industry today is the second world, uh, second worst polluter, both in terms of uh, production and waste. I mean, the EU estimates that 10% of global greenhouse emissions are caused by production of clothing and footwear. So clearly a massive problem for the environment, but also the industry uh, and that requires all parties to, to think differently on how we consume. Um, and and uh, then you see emerging business models coming out, trying to solve this problem, such as uh, the one that has come the farthest, the run, rent the runway in, out of New York, enabling consumers to rent clothes from you know, 750 uh, different designer brands, basically using the clothes from the overproduction. Um, and especially Generation Set has been massively using this service and it's, uh, they're, they're, going, uh, they're going to list soon, and, uh, which has been a fantastic success and, and an example that sustainable business models really are here to stay. And what's really cool about it is that 89% of their members say that they you know, buy fewer clothes than they used to prior to joining and that 80%, 83% consumed less uh, fashion since joining. So for Shipstead, it's important to you know, understand these models and also invest and develop, um, you know, the future generation of sustainable businesses uh, going mm. forward. Yeah. And uh, Christian, what would you say is the most important contribution that, that chips that brings to the startups that they invest in? So, I mean, the, the obvious is our reach. I mean, in chips that we We, uh, we are privileged in a way uh, as an investor. We reach eight out of 10 uh, Norwegians every day. We, we reach seven out of 10 Swedes every day through our media assets. But I, I would definitely argue that the, <clears throat> the most important contribution is our dedicated work as an investor also on, in helping the startups understand the significance of you know, building a strong brand and, and communicating it properly to, to maximize, maximize growth over time. Um, in Shipstead, we, we, uh, we try to contribute both with the, the tool set, but also the laboratory for testing, developing companies throughout the Nordics, um, increasing their probability for uh, having success internationally as well. So, mm. um, yeah. And Andrew, uh, news media, that's been a tough industry globally in uh, recent years. Uh, do you see any potential now for investment in, in news media? I think it's a, it's a very good question. And, you know, news media, it's been a core part of our purpose and I would say critical for a well-functioning society as well. And I think now what you see happening around the world, you know, having trustworthy and transparent news is more important than ever. And this, I would say, is really the, the core of Shipstead's 
uh, DNA, a big part of our, our purpose. And I have to give a lot of compliments to the Shipstead news media team. I mean, they've done an amazing job of building a profitable, growing business in what is a super tough industry. And I think also we, we have an obligation when we talk about news media and investment. You know, you could sort of say it's a challenging uh, industry and, um, you know, treat that as a fixed thing. But I think that, that we view it as something we need to be part of innovating and part of making that an attractive growing industry because of how important it is for society and, and how core it is really to our purpose. Mm. You got me a little bit curious. Do you have anything specific in mind here that you can share? Unfortunately, nothing we can share now, but hopefully you'll see, see some interesting things popping out in the future. Mm. Then we're looking forward to hearing more about this. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Christian, for being with us uh, this morning. Thank you, Mari. Thanks, Mari. Thanks, Christian. <laughs> so now we've heard from some of the key people within Shipstead working with the venture investments. But this session uh, would, of course, not be complete without one of our startups talking from their perspective. And uh, joining us today to give us a short pitch and a presentation is uh, Geir Atle Bora. He is a CEO of crowd lending company Funding Partner. He will tell us a bit more about his startup and how and when Shipstead came in. Hi, Guy Rattle. Good morning. Good morning, Mari. I see you have a nice uh, Christmas tree already in your house. At least that is ready for Christmas. All the presents are not ready. <laughs> okay, so I hope your, uh, your presentation is ready because now you're going to give us a short presentation of your company. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'm super excited uh, about telling you a little bit about Funding Partner, what we do, uh, and our vision. Um, our vision is that every small and medium-sized company in the Nordic should get the financing they deserve. Uh, and in this slide, you can kind of see one of our projects where we work for a medium-sized company called Villa Seafood. They got 12 million uh, kroners from us uh, from 523 investors. And that's just one example where the investors got 10% interest and this company got to expand to the UK uh, and start their production there. The way uh, we do this uh, is by uh, doing the same as uh, investment banks do for bigger companies. On the left side, you can kind of see how a traditional capital structure looks like, where you have a bank loan in the bottom, as well as equity, and you have bonds. The problem for small and medium-sized companies is that there is no bond market. So what we do is provide these type of loans with higher risk, uh, higher interest rate than bank loans, but it's still much cheaper than equity. Uh, the way we do this is through a crowd lending model, like Mari said, uh, where we connect the uh, companies on the one side with people like yourself and myself who want to invest um, directly. We screen all the companies uh, and only the best ones are put out. The way we do that is by putting it out on our platform. So this is a picture of today's uh, platform, how it looks like. Right now we have a company with uh, electric moped cars who's about to fill up uh, their loan. And that's one example, I guess, of something we will see a lot on the, on the roads uh, for the next year uh, of future trends. Uh, the way we do this is having a countdown before the loan goes live. And you get to have the chance in 24 hours to read up on all the details before you decide if you want to invest as little as 1,000 kroners. And you can invest for, from any one of the Scandinavian countries. Last slide. Uh, we kicked off and launched in September 2018. Uh, and already uh, quarter four uh, in 2018, ships invested. So we've had them along uh, since then. And it's been a fantastic journey so far. I guess it's up, up, and up. And we've had a ton of help from Shipster so far, from everything from marketing uh, through competence and their network.
for the presentation, Gerartla. So uh, are you competing with the normal banks to offer these loans? Good question. Uh, I would say simply no. Uh, the banks uh, tend to, if you get a bank loan, you take it. It's 5% interest. We are a higher uh, interest rate and it's also more like a supplement, not uh, an alternative. Mm. And how has this the last uh, Corona year been for a funding partner? So it was dark uh, as for any business, I guess. We didn't know what was happening and what was going to go on. But after a few months, the market opened up. And since then, a lot of businesses have has wanted to take the opportunity to uh, to go ahead full throttle. And since then, uh, we've been kind of hitting all our targets, uh, both the last year and this year. And we've launched a new product called Venture Debt as well. So it's really cool to help out uh, to, to scale ups. Hmm. And uh, you told us a little bit about it, but uh, how has the ships that contributed uh, since investing? So I guess Shipstead is a, an expert in uh, platforms and marketplaces. So that's one of the areas where we've gotten a lot of help in terms of uh, their competence, how to refine and, and modify our product. Uh, and also on the marketing side, uh, improving uh, the look and feel and how to reach as many as uh, people and, and companies as possible. We've gotten a ton of help. Hmm. And uh, as a founder, uh, Guy Rattle, what has been the most important learning uh, that you can pass on to other founders as a tip? So uh, being a founder, you need to cover a lot of bases. Uh, so I guess I'll just pick one base now in terms of giving tip. Uh, and if I pick the topic of financing, uh, since that's a lot of what's being discussed today, it's that you need to uh, meet a ton of investors before you uh, find the perfect match. Uh, investors look for different things. And even though you have a good company, a good idea, some people will not see the value in it. So never give up and kind of go out hunting, as Dan said uh, in the beginning. It's a good time to be hunting. Okay, thank you uh, for that, Guy Rattle. I hope uh, you will have some presents uh, under your tree uh, a week or so from now. Uh, thank you so much. And... Um, Going forward, uh, our next guest is uh, Hanne Holstedt. She is uh, head of marketing for Shipstead Adventures. Uh, and she writes in the Future Report about how to create brands that people love. Hello. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit about my article in uh, the Future Report. The marketing discipline has of late been obsessed with short-term performance marketing, I think. And that's quite understandable in a world where there's easier than ever to both measure and get quick results. However, it seems that many of us have forgotten the true value of being a strong and attractive brand. And that's maybe especially true for you creating new companies, since you want to make a difference really fast. I do believe that we should welcome a shift from the all-consuming hacking the algorithm to building a brand when it comes to making startups grow and excel. Now, I could speak to you for uh, hours about this, uh, but hopefully you have some uh, work to do today and some nice Christmas preparations ahead. So I thought I'd use my last minutes uh, here to tell you my top three reasons why you should build a strong brand and my top three tips on how to create a strong brand. So first, a brand is not the nice colors that you sprink on top that really doesn't count in the real business. It is hardcore business and should deliver a higher company value. From an investor's perspective, the value of a company is not just the tech stack, production sites or cur current customer base. What's really important is to have a name with the power to influence future growth. This value lies in the brand. Research shows that companies that successfully develop strong brands consistently outperform the market. So when you're doing your big exit or that IPO you're dreaming of, the brand equity you have built will show in your valuation. 
So remember that when you invest, because it is an investment, not a cost in brand building. And be sure to measure your team on the brand equity that they create, not just the conversions that you measured this morning. Secondly, in some industries, you see companies running a race to the bottom, competing only in price. In others, you see a few strong brands completely owning the industry and making it near impossible for others to enter. Warren Buffett, a man that we could agree has some proven experience in evaluating companies, once said, the single most important decision in evaluating a business is pricing power. If you have the power to raise your prices without losing business to a competitor, you've got a very good business. If you have to hold a prayer session before raising your prices by 10%, you've got a terrible business. So third, but not last. And keep in mind that the single biggest driver for advertising effectiveness is brand size and market share. It's more than creativity, more than targeting and more than channel choice. The investments that you will make in taking the lead will pay off in every other advertising effect investment you make in the future. The tactical and performance marketing will exploit your brand equity. So be sure you build one. Okay. So now uh, I've told you uh, among very many reasons, uh, my top three for why you should build a strong brand, but how should you proceed? What's the recipe? I'll give you uh, three quick tips uh, on your way to success. So one, know your target group. Now that might sound obvious and intuitive, and you usually have a lot of valuable behavioral data on your first customers to analyze and base your decisions on. But if that's all you have, you can be walking a dangerous path. You need to know not only your first adapters, they may behave quite differently than the majority of potential customers. But most importantly, you have to look beyond behavior and find attitude data. Because although we like to think of us as, as uh, rational consumers, we're not. Our decisions are based on emotions and that gut feeling that a brand can evoke. You want to speak to the user's hearts, not only their brains. Know what really drives your target group choices and you'll be halfway there. Number two, you have to be distinct. When building a new company or product, I would argue that a big part of discussion centers around how we need to be different from the competitors. Take a different position. Now, I believe that's valuable discussions, but different must not be chosen merely because it's different. That's not a reason for consumers to buy a product or service. You must solve their problem, just as your competitors do, although preferably much better. But from a brand building perspective, it's imperative that you are distinct. And here comes the strategic importance of design into the picture, or coloring as some people that quite not seeing the value of branding tend to call it. Have a look at some companies in your category, and you will be amazed on how similar some of them look especially in the startup world. So how will the potential customers distinguish them from each other? So my last tip that also will conclude my presentation um, comes here. The fundamentals of marketing and communication will always be true. Now, we have a lot of new communication technology and different evangelists, as they call themselves, telling us that things are so very different these days. But it's not. The fundamentals of marketing and communications will always be true. And do you know why? Because they're based on how our brains work, not on how any specific technology works. Now, all developments in communication technology are really just software. The human brain is the hard way they all have to run on. Specifically, the 150 million old limbic system that governs our primitive physical, emotional drives, our motivation and memories and decision-making. 
So remember that technology is a means to an end and not an end on itself. The end is to create a name, a brand, with the power to influence people and your company's future growth. Thank you, Hanna. Those were some great takeaways. Um, if you were to say one thing that's uh, most exciting about your job, what would it be? Well, <clears throat> I get to uh, work with all the companies in, in uh, our portfolio, helping them with these questions. And um, well, <clears throat> it's, we, we rarely see marketers or brand, brand people starting companies. It's usually uh, technology people or, or engineers. Uh, so I think that the, the contribution in talking about these themes that really have, we, we can really contribute to, to, um, to the company, uh, making better decisions around their brand. Hmm. Thank you so much, Hanna. And thank you all uh, that have presented here today. And of course, all of you being uh, with us from your office or your uh, home office. We will be hosting more of these events, uh, showcasing different topics from Future Report 2022 in the course of the next year. And I hope to see you again uh, at one of our events, either uh, digitally or live. Read the full report on futurereport.shipstead.com. It's free and for everyone. Have a great holiday season, everyone. My name is André. I work at uh, Shipstead, specifically uh, Hailtiem. I'm Sumit and I work in Shipstead Group as uh, the head of diversity, inclusion and belonging. I'm going to show you my life, my work. Hopefully, it's interesting. My name is Alexandra and I am a trainee at Shipstead. I am Sana Eriksson. I am the head of engineering here at Dori. I work with the coolest team. We create and build integrations and APIs. Today I'm uh, heading to the office after being home for a year during Corona. What really strikes you about this is the sense of buzz and energy. That really brings home to you just how impactful the things are that ships that does. My dream or vision is to uh, make a society where everyone can flourish and explore their differences. The diversity has been sort of ingrained within the culture and the values of the company. And that, that, that is really something that I can get behind of. And I get to work with so many talented and driven people and I get super inspired by that. I can travel around the world and, and meet people. People from different sides of the world, different aspects. I think it's amazing. It's a privilege for me. I really, really love my, my role here. I've felt like part of the team from day one, which is a wonderful feeling. I'm glad you we're working here. For sure, I can say that I love my job. Do you actually feel that you make a difference? I hope. Uh, to bring that uh, into ships as well, uh, so that there is room for everyone to bring their whole self uh, at work in uh, Shipstead. Sinne